I would like to say thank you for tuning in to West Windsor Church on this Sunday uh, after Easter. It is great to be uh, with all of you online. And remember, as uh, this sign says here, to subscribe to P. Wall, we'd really appreciate that. We are going to get back into the book of Revelation today, and we're going to be in uh, chapter 7, and as we are, are there, and as we are going to be going through verses 1 through 9, uh, we are going to be looking at quite a few exciting scriptures, so join me in prayer. Lord, be with us as we uh, embark on a journey through Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 through 9. I thank you for the personal excitement and vibrancy that I have felt as I have walked through the forest, right on the ground, picking up all sorts of stones and sticks and nuggets that are the very core of this great, great book of Revelation. Be with us now. Bless the hearers of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I'm going to give an introductory illustration to this sermon on being amazed. Being amazed. There was a man who was uh, recently driving his car out in the country a little bit. And he's moving along about, you know, as fast as you can go on a two-lane country road. He's going by farms and things like that. And he's going 55 to 60 miles an hour. And uh, as he's going along, he's doing a good job of paying careful attention to the road. And all of a sudden, to his right, he notices a big, white, three-legged, fast chicken running past him. The chicken darts out in front of him, continues to go faster than he can, and zips into a farmer's driveway on the left side of the road. Well, this driver said, you know, I have never seen anything like that before. I got to check this out. So what did he do? He pulled over, backed up, went back, drove up that uh, farmer's driveway, and the farmer greeted him after about 100 feet or so and said, hello there, uh, what can I do for you? He said, well, he said, there was a three-legged chicken that ran past my car and went up your driveway, and I wanted to make sure I wasn't seeing something, that it wasn't a figment of my imagination. He said, no. I have a whole bunch of three-legged chickens. He said, my wife and I love to eat chicken legs. And so we just love, you know, to have a bunch of chickens. And the guy said, well, have you ever eaten one of those three-legged chicken legs? And he said, no, we've never been able to catch one. Okay. So an amazing story. And an amazing passage of scripture that we are about to enter into here uh, on what the, is entitled The Harvesting into a Signet Seal. I want you to know I've never used that I can recall that word in the title, signet. And you can see in it the word sign, and then the ET, and basically what it is, it's, it's, it's a ring that has a seal on it. The kind of seal that could be put on hot wax that is sealed on an envelope. And then that seal, it's got a signet seal on it. And so that's basically summarizing where we're going in the book of Revelation chapter 7. Three things we will consider today. Number one, the transitioning sixth seal reveals this signet seal. You know, last week when I was going through Revelation, I, or the last time I did it, I said to myself, you know what? I made a mistake. 
the seal that I was thinking was mentioned here in verse 2. I said to myself, that, that's the introduction of the seventh seal. No, it's not. It is the introduction of a signet seal. And that signet seal is eventually going to be used to mark the foreheads of all those who convert to Jesus and his father. And so the sixth seal, number one, reveals a signet seal, then a bunch of angels, and then this no harm is going to come to the earth until everybody is sealed or marked. And uh, that's point number one. Point number two is the transitioning of the sixth seal reveals the signet sealing of the 12 tribes of Israel. And it's always great excitement to come to this passage where you see 144,000 uh, Jewish people come to faith in the Messiah at the end times. And then the third transitioning seal revolve, reveals signet of, vast, of a vast impressive crop. A vast impressive uh, converted crop of souls. And we're just going to touch that verse 9 and move into it a little bit and then, that, then our sermon will be over. So take your sermon outline and you know one of these days I believe I'm going to find a way to take my sermon outline and attach it to the video so that when you click underneath the video, you'll be able to print that out. I think we should be able to do that. I just have to figure that out. In the meantime, we're emailing it to people, putting it on Facebook, that sort of thing. Okay, Revelation 7 verse, verse 1, and I'm going to read um, all that is on your sermon outline uh, through chapter 8, verse 1. I'm only going to really read three verses of Scripture, and I'm going to give you also a little bit of, uh, of some definitions that will be helpful to us as well. Verse 1, After this happened, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. We touched that last time. The angels were holding the four winds of the earth, stopping the wind from blowing on land, sea, or any tree. Verse 2, then I saw another angel coming from the east. This angel had, and there you'll see, the signet seal of the living God. This, the word signet is in uh, italics because only one other translation that I found used that word, and that was a Greek translation. There was another translation that changed this to the word mark, had a mark of the living God, which, I, which is what tipped me off to realize that this is not the seventh seal here. This is a special seal that will be used to mark people who come to know the Lord due to the Father's farming methods that are bringing about all these people to the Lord and is part of the de-weeding process. God isn't angry with the weeds. God is just removing the weeds so that those who come and are a part of his harvest or the wheat as in Matthew 13 verses 36 through 40, Feel free to rewind this message. If you need that again, Matthew 13, 36 through 40. And you'll see Jesus saying, the end times is like a farmer who plants a field. So all of these farming methods are going on. And now is a signet seal introduced. Verse 2. The angel with that seal called out in a loud voice to the four angels, these were the four angels that God had given the power to damage or hurt the, the earth and the sea. And the angel said to them, verse 3 down below, don't harm the land or the sea before we mark the foreheads. 
So that's where all this is going. Now we've already touched on what is right underneath your easy to read versions, scriptures, that the Greek word orge is translated here as a movement of, of the soul. So it is a farming movement of this first tribulation period that these things are going on. And it's about weed removal. And then you'll notice a definition that I've provided to the left of that Greek word definition. You'll see signet. A small seal, especially one set in a ring, used instead of a signature to get to give authentication to an official, or in this case, to give authentication to the great crop of converts. And you see the listing of the Greek words there, and uh, this seal then has is a mark that has significant kingdom meeting, and I'm not going to turn my uh, outline over yet, but if you do, you'll see some of the ways history interprets this in the uh, way in which Christians were persecuted in John's time when he wrote this, and certainly he's alluding to this and to the future uh, when he talks about a lot of the suffering and things that are going on there. Let's go to the outline under A then, under point number one. Remembering the revelation of more angels emerging with purpose. And we see then, underneath the sixth seal actions that we've already been involved in quite a bit, there are these four directional angels that appear. I cannot... Uh, talk about the mystery of angels too much. Angels are a part of every one of our lives. Here, they have a very unique role in bringing about a, a, a movement toward the end of the earth. Okay, and um, But you and I need to have faith, and we need to pray consistently that God sends his angels to us. And if you want to have fun, I even will say this to you. Pray that he sends one of these four directional angels to you. And I bet he'll do it. I bet he'll do it. Okay, continuing then uh, with point number two under A, the mysterious angelic no harm, the halting of the wind blowing at all. And this is a mystery. You know, we are definitely looking at uh, all of this. It's, it's got great mystery. We can't understand it. But I think, just as John Calvin said, we ought to think about what the word election means in Romans 9 and in Romans chapter 14. Not that we can figure it out, but we ought to be able to touch it and, and feel it and just hear the way it is worded in God's word. And I think that's what we need to do here too. What does it mean by the wind stops or is halted so that no harm can come? I mean, there's a, there's a lot of um, logic that could say if, if the wind were to stop, that would create harm in and of itself. The wind is very needed to move pollen around and this sort of thing. But in this particular uh, uh, part of verse 1, it says, there will be, for the sake of no harm, the halting of the wind. Number three, to perceive John's style of using double meanings with the same word. I want you to know, as we get, get to verse 2 now, this angel had the signet seal of the living God. Again, that's put in there in italics. Your, your version should read, having the seal of the living God. And so a person can easily get um, confused in thinking that this is a, the seventh seal. It's not. What's important about that is to know that God, in God's command center, in the way he's making all of this happen in the farming movement, that this is important. There's this emergence of a seal that's happening. And I would say this to you. 
If you have never struggled and asked God to give you assurance of salvation, if you have never said to God, God, I want you to put it deep in my heart. I want to be able to go to sleep at night and be certain that I will go to heaven when I die. Ask, say this because of your being introduced to this seal signet here. Say, put that seal on me, God. Put that same seal on me that's going to be put on these converts from the farming methods starting in the first six seals in the book of Revelation. And I believe that you will make progress in your faith by doing that. Okay? So we've touched A under number three. Now we go to B. Important to realize that this is now not the seventh seal, but a forehead seal or mark. And if you turn over your scripture sheet, you will see some real simple marks that were used back in the time of the Roman persecution around 100 AD or so. And they would take uh, an ashes and they would put the, the mark of the cross on their forehead. And so John is, is alluding to this. And I think it has meaning for both back then and I also think it has meaning for the picture that I have also put on the back of the sermon sheet, which is that beautiful picture there, as you can see, of this awesome-looking angel who has maybe a giant ring on, and that ring then is burning a seal onto the foreheads, or it is simply imputing it onto the forehead, doesn't need to be any pain or anything like that, but it, it, it is a mark that is happening. And I believe that the, the, um, the marking then that will happen has significance both in this world with the converts and also in heaven. And I do think that when, we, when we're talking about how John loves to use uh, words that give double and beyond meanings, that this is what is going on here. Let's not limit it to a certain interpretation, but let's just see that there's a multifaceted purpose and, and thing happening that God is orchestrating with, this, with these angels that are all around the command center, or as it is usually translated, the throne of God, and all of that is going on to eventually bring a seal or mark to a person's forehead. And we know the scary mark is coming on in, in a later part of the book of Revelation, which is called the mark of the beast. This is the mark of the living God, of the Father of Jesus. Okay, and then see, considering how one is sealed by God normally today, uh, we have already kind of touched on that uh, the importance of feeling that you have God's seal of approval on you. If you, if you are, are saying, hey, can you, can you explain that to me right now? Yeah. The seal of God upon you is through faith. It is all about you saying, I believe in you, Lord. Whatever little amount of faith you, you may have, you say, Lord, I believe this much and I give that to you, I want to be connected to you. And then you should hear God say back to you, increase that faith every day of your life until you go to heaven. And that is living in the kingdom of God. So take that little bit of faith and say, I'm with you, God. Jesus said, you're either with me or against me. You've just aligned yourself with Jesus. And just say then, Lord, help me give my heart. Help me give more of myself to you every day that I am alive. Okay, and that is involved then in this being sealed by God. And not only is it happening in the future and maybe back in the day when the, the church was created in Rome and, and after the resurrection happened, when all these things were putting the, the church together, but it also happens today. And I wanted to make sure we touch that. Okay, we're going to look a little bit more carefully now at this signet, the, the mysterious emerging 
of this special signet, seal, and mark. And so why, why did it happen? Why does this angel have this ring? Uh, what's going on there? Let's, let's flip over our outline. You can see the presidential seal, can't you, of the United States of America. Uh, in my office at the church, it's an amazing thing, isn't it, to think that we really can't even go to church now? Uh, does that feel like the end times a little bit? I think it does. Is God going to use this COVID-19 experience where churches are basically closed to bring about a revival, to bring about a, a farming conversion crop of souls? I think it might. And I think the church working harder to get everything online is, a, is going to be a part of that. Because there's a lot of what people call the millennial individuals who are 15 to 20 percent less inclined to go to church. We may be able to reach them through the way we're getting all of this online. Now, but if you look at the, um, that emblem, and as I'm looking at it, uh, a good, it was done well in that it is uh, showing on the very top of the seal, it says the President of the United, of the United States. And then you can see that word seal. I actually have cufflinks in my uh, office that have the seal of the president. And I, I don't wear them because normally I just like to button my sleeves and leave it at that. But I have them there on display because it's important to me. Someone who has served with presidents uh, sent them as a gift to me one Christmas. Same thing here. The seal is on this angel. And it's being introduced to us, and it's very important. And it's, it's being introduced because that particular angel has been given the job of marking Christians. I want to emphasize this. No one has the purpose that you have. God has given you a purpose just like he gave this angel a purpose. Notice the four angels that are, that are working with the wind. They aren't doing that purpose. That is the unique purpose of the angel. God is in the business of setting you apart. He's in the business of setting me apart. So that we do what we are supposed to do that no one else can do. And so the, re the revealing of this signet seal with this one particular angel now, is center stage. And now we focus, number two, on the seal or ring or mark, and it's going to signify that there was a conversion that took place. You may be asking, how can I give more of my life to God today? or at this moment, or in the coming week. I think this is a very good way uh, to, to look at it, is ask God in your heart and in your mind to seal you more so. You probably haven't used that language before. So you're praying, say, God, as you use this angel to put a seal on somebody, put that seal on me. Let me feel sealed. Let me feel ready to be opened and used by you every single day of my life. That is what God wants to do with you and me. It's called holiness. The Greek word for holiness means to set apart. It's that simple, friends. It's that simple. God has a purpose for you. You need to set yourself apart so that he and you together can get to your purpose. And you know what? Jesus said there's only two commandments in the new covenant. Love God, love yourself, and be connected to each other, and do your purpose. And then God will say, now I'm going to bring some of your neighbors to you in the middle of this too. And then you do that as well. But that's how simple life is. And God is working with you in that way. Okay, now we are going to move from verse 2 
and move into verse 3. And this is referring to the 144,000 Israelites. And then in verse 9, beyond numbering, it's going to go there. Okay, so notice in verses 3 and 4, you'll see that um, the ones on the easy-to-read version read, don't harm the land or sea before we mark the foreheads. How are the foreheads going to be marked? By the signet seal with that angel. So that angel will have this job. Who, and these are who serve our God. Verse 4. Then I heard how many people had God's signet mark on their foreheads, and they were 144,000, and they were from every tribe of the people of Israel. And then you see in verses 5, 6, and 7, and 8 from the contemporary English version uh, how it is very clearly and simply showing that there were 12,000 converts from each one of those tribes. But for now, we're just going to focus then on the uniqueness of this number being used, 144,000. And you know, I'm not going to go back into history. You know, in the, in the 17, 1800s, early 1900s, there were a few religious groups that thought this was referring to them and, and their coming out. But let's just keep it simple. This is really just about Jewish people. This is about the Israelites. And these are, these are a group of people that are basically going to say, in light of God's farming methods that I am able to perceive that seem to be happening everywhere, earthquakes, you know, sickness, all the different things that are a part of seals one through six, we're seeing them, and guess what? We're saying we are now believers in the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the F God the Father. And, the, and they're saying that, and they're saying, please seal me. I think we can keep it that simple. And it's just a mark of beauty that all of this is going on. There's 12 tribes of Israel. They are all listed there, and each one of them has 12,000. And now we, be, we see this mark put on their forehead, and then we are aware that later on, there is the coming of a mark of the beast. And that is the, the second part of the tribulation. I like to, to, to keep everything as simple as I can. And one of the things that I, I will say is this. In this first tribulation period, with these first six seals, you basically have God, the farmer, having all sorts of things happen in the world to, you might say, fertilize the soil so that there will be a growing that takes place and a growing of love and belief and faith in Jesus and God the Father and the Spirit. And as all that is going on, then the Lord is going to remove the weeds, those who say, nope, that's not me, from the ones who say, yes, I want you, Lord. And then... Um, there's going to be this marking that goes on. Uh, later on, uh, I believe in the second part of the tribulation, the second tribulation period, this is more of a battle between uh, God and Satan. And it's kind of a slugfest, I like to think. And, and all of that is going to be going on. And there, you are going to see the wrath of God. In this first in these first Revelation 5 through 7 chapters, I don't really see it to be about wrath. I see it to be God's farming movement, that he's making all this happen for the sake of harvest. And so we see a Jewish harvest here that is mentioned. And then as I've, as I've been talking about be under uh, 
the uh, election of the Israelites here with the 12,000. Uh, let's go to C under number three. The Apostle Paul talks about the election of the Israelites. And um, you can look up that verse, uh, chapter 11 and verse 7, and see how it, it alludes to uh, the Lord electing Israel to be his chosen people. And so uh, this coincides with that. It kind of touches that whole election thing. And it's also a part of Revelation 14 as well. Just wanted to make sure we, we touch that. Let's go to the second point now. The transitioning sixth seal reveals the signet sealing of the 12 tribes of Israel. This one we will go through pretty quickly because we see that it's 12,000 crop converts in each tribe. And uh, one of the things that's neat about having the Old Testament uh, in the Bible, you know, the New Covenant, the New Testament, really is what made the Old Testament famous. You wouldn't have a lot of people knowing very much about the Old Covenant or the Old Testament, but the, because of the resurrection and how that has heightened awareness about who Jesus was, then some light has been shared uh, on the Old Testament. And it's very um, fun, I believe, and inspirational to read about the different tribes of Israel and how each tribe was formed based upon an individual's life, and, and then that tribe was given a name. And so, mysteriously, 12,000 in each of the 12 tribes, and then you multiply that and you get 144,000. We've done a good job of, of touching some of those scriptures already, but now we begin to lift our eyes up a little bit because this is called the book of Revelation, the book of seeing new things, seeing clearly what's going to happen at the end of the world. And now we lift our eyes up and we see over the heads of the, gen of the Jewish people, we see the emergence of a vast crowd, a vast crowd of people. And so we see that in the outline, the Gentiles, big, farmed, fertilized, conversion, crop, harvest. And we begin now to see that in the ninth verse. And so as we enter this ninth verse, you, we, we are also entering the third main point. Then I looked, and there was a large crowd. So this is how we transition out of the second point. We look over those 144,000 and we see this emerging, loud, large, big crowd. Someone says, how, did, how does God do that? Well, you know, maybe, maybe he has a large fog that comes over. And the fog only allows you and I to see the 144,000 Israelites. And then that fog is lifted. And, and as that fog is listed, lifted, and as the sun shines brightly through, we're able to see the light come on this large, vast crowd of people. And so as we, we, we look further, we see that there were so many people that no one could even count them all. And so we see that in A, the first big crop of the mysterious number. B, considering Israel as the first and the elect. And then C, the Revelation zoom camera suddenly goes to a big, and now notice on your outline that phrase, all-inclusive crowd. And you see, maybe for some of you, this is the first time you will notice the difference in the Bible between the New Covenant 
which started with the resurrection of Jesus and even the baptism of Jesus in the River Jordan. But the, the new covenant emerges. The new covenant is for all the people in the world. The old covenant was primarily and truly for Israel. Other people might be able to get involved a little bit in there, you know, but for the most part, these are people that are of Israel and how Israel was formed. But now here, the Father's farming methods now, after Jesus died on the cross, everything is set up so that everyone in the entire world can be reached with the good news, the gospel of Jesus. And it's for absolutely everyone. And that's why it's so important that when you're reading your Bible, that you see that in that new covenant, it's a much different approach to life. The old was about the law. The new is about your faith and it transforming you, making changes in you so that God can be glorified in you so that you can be set apart for him. And in the midst of that, then, all these people emerge and appear. And they speak different languages. They have different skin colors. They have different hair colors, different eye colors. Uh, they may be shorter, they may be uh, taller, they may have different attributes, but it's from everywhere and everyone in the entire world. And that's why it's so important when you look at the new covenant that you realize it is a message for every single person. It isn't for people who have a certain lifestyle that, that some Christians think is okay. It's for everyone. And your job and my job is to let God, when he wants to remove the weeds from the wheat, that's his business. We are there to minister to absolutely everyone that God puts in our path. And then guess what? We are a part of God's uh, ambassadors or people who help eventually get all this convert uh, impressive crowd uh, coming to know the Lord. So under C then, and the zoom camera, let's look at number one. Lo, revealing vision of purpose of all fertilized farming methods. Now let's go up to the uh, introductory paragraph for this sermon. I'm going to read that to you. I think it does a good job of describing what number one means here. As we see God at work, farming, removing the tares and the weeds from the main crop of souls, we watch with great wonder. How great it is to know Jesus was sent because God loves us. And now still, in the sixth seal, a signet seal appears, more angels appear, and lo, notice that word lo, and lo, fertilized harvest conversion crop begins to be revealed. We're going to see um, this alluded to much more so as we continue to go through the book of Revelation in a way where we're right on the ground. We're walking through the forest. We're, we're, we're going to see everything. We're not flying over it with a helicopter. We're going re really deep into it. Number two, revealing the wind blown in the new covenant farming to all peoples. How did it happen? One way of describing uh, how all of this got started is to say that the wind blew in Jesus at the time he was born. 
He was raised, and then that same spirit or wind blew him into the various disciples' lives and into the various people's lives. Then when he rose from the dead, the wind would continue to blow the risen Jesus and the Spirit of God all around the world into your life and into my life. And, um, and that's the way God works. It's a mystery. But know, know that he loves you and that that wind will blow certain people into your life that wind will blow certain transitions into your life, and you and the Lord figure out what it all means and work through it. And then you and I are a part of the New Covenant farming to all the different peoples all over the world, and it's also happening uh, as we, we see verse 9. Okay, we've already touched on the limited Old Covenant to Israel, B, the unlimited wind-blown new covenant, which could reach everyone. Notice that word unlimited. In the new covenant, there is no limitation. The only limitation might be faith. You need to put your faith in Jesus. How do you get faith, somebody says? Well, friend, every time you sit in a chair, when you sit down in it, you believe that chair will hold you up. If that chair were really flimsy, you would fall to the ground. But you say, no, I believe it will hold me up. And you say the same thing to God. I believe, God, you love me and that there's a place for me and a purpose in my life, and we'll find that and work through it as we go through this world. That's faith. And it, will, it is there to reach everyone. Continuing then, let's look at... Uh, some of these things a little more carefully. The new covenant Jesus vision to take the gospel to all earth languages. Let's look a little more carefully at verse 9. A large crowd of people. Easy to read version. So many no one could count them all. Notice now they were from every nation. I served as a missionary once um, in Denmark. I remember people said to me and my family as we were going there, why would you want to go to Denmark? It is a um, civilized country. Well, you see, the gospel is for, notice it says here, every nation. Every nation. And I was working with a very large denomination at that time, and I continue to work with all the denominations. I consider myself very interdenominational. Um, and so our missionaries to this day want to make sure we're, we're active in every nation in the world. Notice tribe. This is why it's important that we go to all the tribes in Africa or all the tribes in, in Central America. Every race of people uh, in, in the New Covenant, it says we are to get rid of judgment and condemnation, and therefore we will never be racist, but we will be for all the races in the world. And notice, and language, language of the earth. And so Jesus said, we will learn all these different languages, which is why it's so beautiful to behold God has set up different mission groups and their job is to learn languages that up to this point were never really written down. And they're going to try to write them down for the sake of the gospel as we continue to get to the end here of our third point with the transitioning of the sixth seal and this vast impressive crop. And then we see at the end of verse 9, uh, we're just going to touch this and begin with this the next time we're, get, we're together. They were standing before the throne, I like to call it the command center, and before the Lamb, and that's Jesus. Why is Jesus called the Lamb, someone says? Because he was willing to be humble and be sacrificed on the cross, even though he committed no sins, for the sake of forgiveness, and so that he could bring forgiveness to all people. And so we have other things that we could do, but let me just end 
uh, with this illustration and consider talking about um, all of the different many thousands of people that we see right now who are dying of COVID-19. We cannot help but appreciate the medical staff that helps and is on the front lines of this battle. We see that um, we are for trying to do what we can in the church at this time by not assembling for the sake of safety, but we look forward to the removal of some of this so that the personal aspect of the church can re get reestablished. And we will look forward then to more and more people that we can touch in this way as we look at the end of verse 9. Uh, we, are, we are appreciative of the martyrs of Rome and see this large number of people that you, you assume have come through trouble and trials and tribulation. And you think and you pray now for all of the people who have lost loved ones. And you see in heaven them coming in this large, massive movement and being able to come before the Lord and being able to enter heaven because of their faith in Jesus Christ and their love for God in the midst of being removed from this world. And so we, we see this large group of people we end with seeing this large group of people, and we will talk about it more so. We are in a time where a lot of people do believe, and they want to talk about signs and things that are related to sickness and whatnot, and I, and I want to honor those people, but I want to just say, I am burdened by COVID-19. I am burdened by some people who have lost some loved ones in the midst of this, and I just say to you, um, Jesus loves you. Jesus died for you. Jesus will bring comfort to you because he cares about you. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you that Jesus has set up an eternity for us. Lead, lead and guide us so that we can embrace Jesus right now. If, there, if you're listening and you've never said, Jesus, come into my heart right now, you can pray with me, Jesus, enter my heart right now at this very time and come in there and live with me and we'll get set apart together. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for tuning in and watching and God bless you.